your ministry. The Lord bless us this year to have the honor and distinct privilege of sharing uh, the annual sermon in the 71st session of the Washington Annual Conference. And um, so many of you mentioned, uh, Reverend, you got to bring that home. And so um, we freshened up the loaf of bread and we're bringing it home today. Amen. Uh, it represented Union Bethel, uh, but now, as so many have said, we are now sowing it into uh, Union Bethel. Of course, we receive God's word uh, in whatever venue uh, the word comes in, uh, but I'm appreciative for your prayers and uh, uh, it enable us to be able to share God's word with God's people. In the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 25 through 33 in the New Living Translation. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united in one. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Our sermonic focus on that 27th verse. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. And for just a few moments, will the real church dot 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 or ellipsis will the real church go ahead and text someone and say pastor's preaching will the real church message them it's been a hell of a year Wherever we have turned, we have seen hell loose its barrage of attacks against the lordship of Christ and against his church, his living body in the earth. It's been a hell of a year. Apocalyptic visions have seized our spiritual attention in a way that we had not seen since the few church-filled prayer meetings which followed 9-11. Let me say parenthetically that we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. It's been a hell of a year. We have wrestled with a threefold pandemic, COVID-19, cacophonous racism, and catastrophic economic fallout. It's been a hell of a year. Our hands have been ablaze with the fury of hand sanitizer oozing into cuts and abrasions. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's been a hell of a year trying to keep eyeglasses from fogging up from the breath, escaping the tops of our masks to the point where people have now created a, a fogless mask. It's been a hell of a year as we have had to hold hands virtually and help people to cross the digital divide and still engage in true worship. It's been a hell of a year. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14, Isaiah the prophet cries out and says, Hell has enlarged itself. Uh, but I got some good news, beloved, where hell expands, heaven encircles. Uh, when, when hell steals, heaven restores. When hell kills, heaven resurrects. 
And when hell destroys, heaven rebuilds. With all of this that is going on, this is the church's finest hour. So watch out, world, because here comes the real church. Watch out, 1% that control 90% of the world's wealth. Here comes the real church. Watch out, Lucifer, morning star. Here comes the real church led by the bright and morning star. You do remember Union Bethel in past lessons that we mentioned biblically that Lucifer and the Lord both have the reference morning star. I'll go back to that, and you can go back in your teaching and notes, but Jesus has the distinction of being the bright and morning star. That's the last star you see when the sun is rising, which means, watch this, he's got the setting in the west, that's the last star, and the sun is rising in the east. Do I have a witness? Meanwhile, back in the fellowship of the saints, let's take a minute to engage in some mirroring and see where we stand. The Sermonic title infers a question that is on the horizon, while the ellipsis further infers that we, those who claim relationship in the real church, should already know the answer. Will the real church dot, dot, dot? Real church folks should know the answer. But like an annual checkup with our physicians, let's go into a moment of checkup with our great physician. A primary care physician, will the real church? I, I need to give you a textual disclaimer, and, and to all of our Bible students and the, uh, scholarly studies of, studiers of God's Word uh, here in this fellowship, I know uh, there's some folk who can just flat down, get at it, break it down, and get with it. And, and, and so I need to make a textual disclaimer because we normally don't come at texts like this uh, and miss some of the narratives. But what you have to understand is when Paul writes, Paul uses illustrative language to support a point. And, and, and what we often forget is there is message in the illustrative illustration, but there's also message in the main point. And so we have to look at the text and understand its main point. I know it starts out talking about husbands loving your wives. That is an illustra uh, illustrative point that does bear understanding and bear our working through it so that we can know what God is saying to husbands and wives. And yes, you know the pericope of that and what it says. I, I, I will just simply say that that is a meta-narrative that Paul used to describe the main thing. However, don't dismiss the meta-narrative. Because, husbands, you ought to love your wives just like Christ loved the church. And so when Paul would write with these meta-narratives and either, even the apostle Peter later in his ministry said, you know, Paul writes some stuff that's just hard to understand. You got to really get with him and be able to unpack it. So allow me to lift out of the text the context in which we set this message and, of course, my brothers and sisters, we take note, come on, Bible study students, to the pretext, which brings us to it, and the post-text, which is what comes after it. The pretext about, this, about the book of Ephesians is Paul, the wise master builder, who is building out the operation of the church. In building out the operation of the church and how the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers work for the unity of the body, he builds out the church and then to further illustrate what he's talking about in terms of Christ Christological relationship, he says, you know, let me get at it this way. A uh, 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 Christ's relationship with the church is like a husband's relationship with his wife. So now that I've given you that disclaimer, we're not in a marriage session right now, although we are. Will the real church Will the real church bow down? Yeah, bow, 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 bow down. Look at verse 26, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. What does it mean to bow down? It means repentance. 
And I've been talking over the course of this last year with uh, uh, various church leaders, both lay and clergy alike, and, and, and all, we're hearing a whole lot of stuff. We're hearing, yes, you got to get your vaccination, and yes, we got to do this, and yes, we got to do that, and yes, we've got to change the political landscape. But you know one word that was absent from a lot of the conversation over the past year was repentance. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means to change our minds. It means to change how we come at church. And this is the fruit that God looks for in our lives. He looks for the fruit of repentance. I was telling a young servant of God, uh, and, and they were saying uh, that they were oh, heartbroken over some things. I said, oh, what you need to know is that God is close to you because he loves a broken spirit, contrite heart. That's where he's close to you, and he can't get close until we are broken. Uh, you remember that the, the Jesus came and cursed the fig tree. You remember when he cursed the fig tree? And he cursed the fig tree because it had leaves but no fruit. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and, and, and Luke describes in the text that it wasn't the season of fruitfulness. It was the season of flowering, so there would not have been fruit. And, and so I always thought that Jesus, that was so mean to come and curse a fig tree for not having fruit when it's not the season to have fruit. And then I had to be reminded of what God, Jesus, was teaching in the example. Uh, when he came, comes back to the tree the next day, the tree is all withered, and he begins to teach the faith lesson. What Jesus is teaching is not just about faith. It is about faith to have fruitfulness. It is about faith to have this is what I do for God as a result of my faith. And so Jesus cursed the fig tree because it had leaves but didn't have fruit. That's just like us in our lives. Just like Adam and Eve cover themselves with leaves because they did not have the fruit of obedience. And so God calls us to repent, bow down. What are we repenting of, Reverend? Idolatry. Sometimes we love the church more than we love the Lord. Let me say that one more time. Idolatry. Sometimes we love the church more than we love the Lord. I'm going to say it one more time for the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we love the church more than we love the Lord. Sometimes we're so enamored with our history or her historicity. This is the way we've always done it, and we're so enamored with it that it becomes an idol in God's way. Do you remember what happened when Israel idolized their temple over their Jehovah? Oh, man, that, man, they had to, man, they had it going on. They had gold plating on the walls. They had bronze plating on the doors. I mean, they, I mean this, this was a sure enough church. You, I mean, this, this was the church you really wanted to belong to. And all, all the bougie folks who were over there. This was the temple that you really, you didn't want to go to synagogue way out there in, in the Netherlands. You wanted to go, yeah, you wanted to go to the big house, man. Oh, this is where it's going on. Do you remember what happened when God uh, 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 got them for idolizing the temple over him? First of all, you have to be reminded that, as he said to David, I didn't ask for no temple in the first place. You can't build nothing that can hold me. <laughs> the, the heavens can't contain me. The earth cannot hold my power. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. So what do you think you can build that I'm going to live in? But I like the idea, David, but I'll let your son Solomon build that place. And so they built the temple, but they started reverencing the temple over the Jehovah. And so what happened? Uh, Jehovah put them out of their temple for 70 years. Ouch. Watch this. I, I, I had to find something out. That temple in today's dollars, Solomon's temple, is worth in today's dollars $216,603,576,000. You mean to tell me God put his people out of a $216 
billion dollar, there is no building like that anywhere, put them out of a $216 billion building and he put them out for 70 years and here we are complaining about being out of the church for just a year. Repair the church in the United States accounts for 20 to 25 percent of land ownership. Not counting all of the hospitals, schools, daycares. That puts the wealth of the church in America in the trillions of dollars. And our church revenue is estimated, even in 2020, church revenue was estimated at $1.2 trillion. And God used the pandemic to push us out of trillions of dollars worth of property, and is there anybody who is going to ask why? Well, the no, 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 you can't put that on the devil because nothing of this magnitude could happen without God's approval. Oh, you, 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 you didn't get that. You didn't get that. And I think that's the reckoning question that people get me. Yes, sickness is of the devil. Disease is of the devil. And we thank God for cure in the earth. We thank God for his healing power. But something of this level, this epic cataclysmic proportion, nothing like that have we seen on the face of the earth for over a century. And somebody needs to be in God's face asking why. Help us to get it right. Bow down to repent. Repent is how we get the spots out. <sighs> without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, I'm coming. Uh, uh, bow down, and, and we know what bow down is. It's, it's worship. It means prostaneo. It means to prostrate oneself. And so watch this, and I've shared it here oh, many times before. Every major religion in the world has the characteristic of bowing or prostrating oneself in honor of the God or gods they serve. But I can't understand why we got drive through, stand up, got to go Christians, and we expect God to do what, he, what we really need him to do. We've got some spots. The problem is we keep using pre-spot treatments. You know, you, you, you know the pre-spot treatments, you remember Shout when Shout first came out? Yeah, and we gonna, guess what? We're going we gonna to shout it out. Yeah, we're going to shout it. Just pray this, and then you put it into a free spot treatment. So we got free spot treatments. We got praise teams, and, and we got bands, and we've got all kinds of techno gadgets. Uh, as, though, as, as though we can't preach without the iPad. My preaching is not complete until I have a tablet. I've got to have the latest going on. We got all of the gadgets, but guess what? The message is still the same. The message has never been come to church. The message has never been build a church. Jesus said, I'll build a church. Gates of hell won't repent, repent, uh, 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 prevail against it. Your message is to say to the people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand with 3 million new cases of COVID-19 in the country of India. You can't tell me that God is not moving his hand back that he might get our attention. So until we go down into the water of repentance, that's that bow down. And in the Jewish tradition, they called it the sanctification of the bride. The bride, she got to be clean. And, and, and like the bride, I, I want to be ready when the bridegroom comes. Uh, you, you, you got me? <laughs> and, and so the, the hymn writer said it this way, just as I am, and, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I, I, I come, I come. Now, not only do we have to bow down, but we... Uh, church, if we're going to be the real church or the real church, or that's who God is calling, will the real church, will the real church get dressed? Get dressed. Uh, look at verse 26, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. If we have truly worshipped, then we are naked before the Lord. Uh -huh. We are in the 
holy of holy spot. And we are truly naked before the Lord. As the living body of Christ, we hope in the context of our fellowship that we may be comfortable with our shared vulnerabilities. Uh, that, that, that's why the, the church as a fa local family of God must be comfortable and, uh, and, and, and loving and understanding about all of our shared vulnerabilities. In other words, you may look like you got it together, but you got some stuff in your life too. And you might look like you got it together, but you got some stuff in your life too. Uh, from, the, from the parking lot to the pool, Open from the back door to the choir stand, we all have some vulnerabilities. So when we come to worship, we are naked before him. He knows us and we know him. Watch this. Just like a bride has a tendency to help, you know, get her dress. I, 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 that, that, that one I had to really kind of repack and re-envision. Um, and, and those of you, my sisters who've been brides, you I, I, I understand it a little better now that this not the normal just get dressed and, you know, fix your hair on your way to work. It, this ain't, this ain't, they kind of dress up. That, that, this, that, this is this once in a lifetime. This is this once in a lifetime where from top to bottom, it's got to be flawless. The hair has to be right. Eyebrows got to be right. Eyelashes got to be right. Eye mascara, all that stuff they put on their eyes got to be right. All of, whatever they put on the cheeks and what I know the foundation and all of this kind of stuff, it's got to be right. The dress has got to be fitting just right. I know brides that will go on long fast because I got to get up in this dress when I come down that aisle it's got to be looking right uh, all of the things but did you know that even in the dressing process because of the magnitude of the clothing <laughs> the bride needs some attendance some people to help her get ready for the wedding and so the body of Christ has bridal attendants to help prepare to her to be presented to the groom. Who are the bridal attendants in the house? Well, I'm one. I'm just a bridal attendant. Hello. Hey, but she's not my bride. I got to get her ready to meet Christ. Here's the unusual thing. You're one of those bridal attendants. A preacher, teacher, you're one of those bridal attendants. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, Bible teachers. Watch this. Not just ordained clergy, but lay. You are one of those attendants of the bride. And because of our shared vulnerability, we ought to be more sensitive to our mutual plight. You don't know what I'm going through. We all going through it. In one way, shape, or form. When we get dressed, because of our shared vulnerabilities and mutual plight, we ought to be more compassionate to the family of God. We ought to be more understanding and loving and forgiving of one another. Uh, and, and if you're holding on to something, well, you know, that brother did this. And it's been three years that you're still holding on to that. And you wonder why you still got spots and God, hello, hello, that's a spot in your life. That's a spot called unforgiveness. We need the spots, the wrinkles put out. We, out of love, ought to help our sisters and brothers with their garments of righteousness and holiness. If we're all planning to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb, when then we have to share in the preparation for the gathering. Uh, you know, how many people, you have some people you love enough that you want, you want them in heaven with you. I want you to be there with, uh, with the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want you to be there uh, when we sit down to dine with Jesus. In the Greek, the word wrinkles is rightus, uh, which means lines or creases in the skin. Uh -huh. And, 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 and so we have to help each other get the wrinkles out. Uh -huh. You have to care about each other enough to want to help each other get the wrinkles out. I, I'm not just going to leave you over there by yourself. You, you're my brother. You're my sister. I, I see some wrinkles, and so I need to help you get the wrinkles out. Watch this. I'm not talking about logs and beams. I'm talking about wrinkles and spots. <laughs> How many of you remember, I'm going to date myself, the number 10 tin tub? Hey, man, I know some of the young ones are Googling it right now. Some of the children are asking them, oh, what do you mean by number 10 tin tub? Number 10 tin tub. That was a big tub that we used to wash, and we use them for foot washing service here. Uh, how many of you remember 
uh, the washboard. Yeah, that, that was that board that you put down in the tub and you can scrub stuff up and down on it. Uh, 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 how, how many of you uh, remember the old fashioned poppy head one in the basement that you had these uh, three, you had the three sinks where you, you wash and then you rinse and then you take the clothes and you'd run it through a wringer. Uh -huh, to help squeeze the water out. Huh? In, 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 anybody understand? And, and, then, and then my mother would do something uh, with, with my dad's shirts, and, and, and eventually mine too. Uh, but but, but when, when she get through washing dad's shirts, she, she, would, she would wring them out. And, and, but then she'd take a big, uh, another big bowl or tub, and, and she would immerse the shirts in water with Niagara starch. Uh -huh. Niagara starch. I'm not, I'm, this long, this long before they had the spray, the spray stuff. This is not the, you know, uh, uh, it one, it's it starch, and then there's another solution that they had, uh, all, all this stuff, and 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 so, uh, she would soak them in Niagara starch, and then she would hang them on the clothesline. You, you, I know you don't know about lines and clothespins. You know, those are things that you actually, you actually hung clothes out to dry. You know, I know we're looking, where's the dryer, y'all? It's straight outside. It's just wherever you want to hang them. Uh, and even when we didn't have lines, uh, uh, there was nothing like a good tree branch. Oh, I'm, just, I'm messing you here. I'm, I know you're all all city-fied up here, up here, bougie and here in Maryland and all that. But, 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 but uh, and I know I'm telling on myself, but I think you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and so when I would go get my dad's shirts off the line, they would be dry and stiff. Stiff as boards. Oh man, that thing, it, it, it was unusual. It was, you know, it, it, it was fascinating to me how something so subtle and soft could get so stiff with just a little starch. But the problem is it had wrinkles. Mm. It had been washed, no spots. It had been rinsed. Uh -huh. It had been immersed in what it needed to be immersed in, and now it is dry, but you still can't present it to anybody because it has wrinkles. Well, uh, we used to uh, iron shirts, and my mother used to tell me about the cat whiskers. Cat whiskers are up around the collar that when you don't iron the front panel of the shirt just right, you're going to have these wrinkled lines, right? And, and, and sisters, you know what I'm talking about as you age. Same thing happens to your wrinkle lines. And, 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 and so the wrinkles were pressed out because of the solution it was soaked in. But it still needed heat to get the wrinkle out. Mm -mm. You've been immersed in starch. You've been dried in the, clean, in, the, in the clean air, but now you need heat and pressure to get the wrinkle. Oh, I just said something. You need heat and pressure to get the wrinkles out. And if you want to know what kind of year we've had, we have had a year of heat and pressure. And I can feel the Holy Ghost pressing out the wrinkles so that we can become the bride of Christ. Challenges, as I see it, we've got too many permanent press, non-iron church folks. Permanent press started in the early, early 20th century, and they created uh, these chemicals that they put into text so that we, uh, uh, into, uh, into solutions, so that we would not have to iron the clothes so much. Because, you know, as we were becoming uh, more self centered, uh, things like ironing, oh, I, I don't iron, I, I don't cook, I don't wash, I don't clean. Hello, somebody. Uh, and, and, and so we wanted to be more permanent press, you know. We could just come down, come by for an hour or two on Sunday and that's all we need. Don't ask me for nothing else. Uh, but if you're going to live the true life of a disciple, you can't wear synthetic garments or makeshift coverings. You can't take what God has designed to iron and press and just say, you know what, I'm going to go with the no iron look. No, you're going to have to have the spots out and you're going to have to have the wrinkles out and the wrinkles are going to take heat and pressure to get them out. Uh, 
how you want to be, Reverend, when he comes. I'm both an attendant and a part of the bride at the same time. But here's what the hymn writer said. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. How you going to be dressed, Reverend? Dressed in his righteousness alone. Because I don't have any of my own faultless to stand before his throne on Christ. Bow down, get dressed, and finally, you got the real church stand out. He's calling us to stand out, and to make her holy and clean and washed. But the problem is we have one thing left. The blood washed all spots. The Holy Ghost saturated us in the Word and when the word, when pressed out in our lives, gets the wrinkles out. But we've got some blemishes. Bl blemishes. Bl bl blemishes. Uh, we're, we're born with blemishes. Uh, David said, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We're born with blemishes. Slight imperfections that defined us as human. I, I, I know you thought you were all that in a bag of chips, but you, you do have some slight imperfections, and that was that, what's, that is what defines you as human. You have birthmarks, one leg shorter than the other, one arm is longer than the other. you got a blemish of the skin, not something that can be washed off so that the notion is not that of purifying something, but of the image of a young and lovely bride with no physical blemish. I want no blemishes. Or, or, or so, so, so here's what we do. We cover them up thinking that that is uh, uh, unacceptable to God. I don't want a spot. I don't want any wrinkles, and I don't want any blemishes. We all have blemishes. What? Beyonce has blemishes. Lapita the Younger, what a beautiful self, has blemishes. Uh, Sisters, I know, I, I know this is going to be a big letdown for you, but Idris Elba has some blemishes. So does Morris Chestnut with his big, cute smile. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're all born with blemishes. The beauty industry has spends $532 billion a year trying to help us to cover our blemishes, slight imperfection. But did you know that according to Scripture in the Old Testament in Leviticus, we find that if you had a slight imperfection or bodily deformity, you were excluded from the priesthood. You couldn't be a part uh, uh, of that royal uh, family of God blemishes. We were all born in sin. So while we're still working on the spots and while we're still working on the wrinkles, that's sanctification, God has the audacity to send us into all the world to get ready for a dinner with the groom. But I got some blemishes, yeah, but I still want to use you. God has the audacity to call us to mission and service to the world around us, even though we may still have some blemishes in our life. Ah, come here, Paul. Help me to understand what's going on. I had some blemishes in my life, and I asked the Lord three times, will you move the blemish? If you can get rid of this, man, I'll have it all together. And God said, no, I'm still sending you out. I'm still keeping the blemish because my grace is sufficient. So how do we work on blemishes? Well, we acknowledge we have them. That's mirroring. We confess our need for him. That's humbly. And we tell our story about his deliverance. That's credit. <laughs> you give credit where credit is due. So how do we make it with blemish? His grace. Well, it's been a hell of a year. But the answer for hell is already in the earth. That, that, that's the church. <laughs> the, 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 the real church. Do I have a witness? When the world shut down, <laughs> the church went outdoors. When hunger walked our streets, the church passed out groceries. We became the grocery store. When the world couldn't get 
toilet paper. You could come to the church and get some toilet paper. When, when you couldn't find a mask anywhere, the church went into the retail business of paper and mask and groceries. And guess what? We gave it all away just for the opportunity to invite a dying world to have dinner with the, the Lamb of Lambs. With all that is going on, this is the church's finest hour. With all that is happening around us, this is the church's finest moment. To stand out and be the church, the bride of Christ in the earth. Uh, yes, we had some spots. He washed our spots away. Yes, we had some wrinkles. Uh, he is pressing them out through the heat and fiery trials that we are going through. And even though we have some blemishes, I hear the Lord say His grace is sufficient. Stand up and be the real church. The real church is rising to the challenge. I like Brother Paul who gives us this beautiful narrative. He helps us to understand what God has called his church to be. Will the real church bow down? Will the real church get dressed? Will the real church stand out? He says as he concludes the writing, I just want you to be clear that though I've touched this marriage illustrative material, what I'm really talking about is Christ and his church. Oh, Brother Paul uh, didn't make it to see the end. Uh, in AD 65, uh, he was beheaded in Rome. Uh, about a year later, uh, Apostle Peter uh, was crucified upside down, uh, also in Rome. Uh, but there was the youngest apostle. Uh, his name was John. Uh, John was about 20 when he started following Jesus. So now he's a grown man. The emperor tried to boil him in oil but he couldn't die. And there on the Isle of Patmos John said, Paul, I got this now. You run your race. Peter, I got this now. You served your time. And I can hear John say, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day to a heroine. So there he is, Apostle John, seeing that vision of the seven churches. But later on in the book, when God carries him to heaven, heaven uh, he looks over uh, and he sees millions upon millions uh, in white robes uh, John asked the angel uh, who are these uh, and the angel said these are they these are they who the robes have been washed uh, these are they uh, who walk through pandemic uh, these are are they who made it through pitiful presidential leadership? These are they who went through overt racism. These are they who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. John saw us. He saw us back then. So we have the victory, church. We have the victory today. I can see it. Can you see it? I can see it. Can you see it? What you see, Reverend? There's an army. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There, there is power. There, there is power. There, there is power. In the name of Jesus, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to, every chain, to loose every bondage, to destroy every yoke. There is power in the name of Jesus. I see it. I see the real church feeding the hungry, the real church preaching the gospel, 
the real church. I won't finish, but I ain't through. Holy Spirit, yesterday, drop this thought down in me. And it just blew me away. Um, many of us, and now we have apps on our phones, but you remember when we couldn't wait to get home because we had to watch the evening news. Uh, we wouldn't go to bed till we had watched the evening news. Uh -huh. And uh, some of us who grew, grew up on Walter Cronkite and Barbara Walters, and I can't even name all these people now. It's long before CNN and all that. And then the world went to 24-hour news. Uh, you got that? And so we could turn to headline news and see the headline at any time of the day. And the Lord said something to me yesterday. He said, look at what's happening now. Who gets more airtime now? I said, what you mean? He said, just look at the numbers. The gospel is getting more airtime than the news. Just go. YouTube, Facebook, Hulu, Roku, prayer conference calls. The gospel is going out like the news. But guess what? We got the good news. <laughs> the good news is that to the utmost, Jesus saves. The good news is that to the utmost, Jesus saves. That's the good news to the utmost, Jesus saves. What will he do, Reverend? He, 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 he'll, he'll pick you up. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. It's going out 24 hours a day. Do you realize people are watching this broadcast now from India? The gospel is going out. And what did Jesus say about the gospel? He said, when the gospel has gone to all the world, then shall the end come. I don't know when it's going to come. But I want to be dressed and ready when he comes. I want to be dressed. I'm getting into a second sermon now. And ready when he calls my name. I want to be dressed. The real church. The real church. The real church. God, in the name of Jesus, through the power of your shed blood, we thank you for your son Jesus, our Savior. Crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. And now reigning and ruling, sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's the message. God, we want to thank you. But though it seemed like it was a hell of a year, when we look around, we see more witnesses of heaven than we have ever seen before. And we want to say thank you. Yeah. Gave us a little boot in the pants, a little kick, kick in the back to remind us of what we are called to do. Thank you. Thank you. We're not thanking you for the pandemic, but we're thanking you in the pandemic. Because in everything, we give thanks. For that is your will. And now, God, we thank you for those who have been blessed to tune in, to hear, to be encouraged in your word. We pray now that you would touch, heal, and bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To the utmost, Jesus saves. What will he do? He will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah. 
Jesus says, won't you help me now to the utmost, to the utmost, Jesus says, to the utmost, Jesus says, he will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah. Jesus say. You know something that this song reminds me of? We, sometimes we're so busy trying to, to uh, get a new word. <laughs> and all you got to do is just go with the word you got. Did you notice Jesus never taught, taught the apostles preaching? He just said, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He never taught them preaching. You know, introduction, point one, point two, point three. He, he never taught them all that. He just said, when you go, say. <laughs> it's just that simple. And the message doesn't change. Now, we got to repackage it and reposition it, but it doesn't change. So when we go to Roku, we're already there. When we go to Hulu, we're already there. YouTube channel, we're already there. Facebook Live, we're already there. Live streaming, we're already there. Church app, we're already there. When you go, the message is the same to the utmost. Jesus said, I don't care how old the song is. The song may be old, but the message is still alive. He saves to the utmost. Mm. Jesus saves to the utmost. Let's get ready to receive our gifts now. I'm going to let you go. I got you much longer than I should have. I told him I was going to preach the 19-minute sermon in 23 minutes, and that didn't happen because I was at home. Hey, man, I was at, I'm, I'm, I'm at home. Uh, so let's do this. Let's, let's prepare to receive our gifts right now, and, uh, uh, and then we'll uh, go into this final uh, Sunday of empty hands, and I'll share with you some things in that regard, uh, and then we'll dismiss from this place. The question is, will the real church bow down? Will the real church get dressed? Will the real church stand out as the bride of Christ? That's what God is calling the real church to do. Thank you so much for your gifts and your sharing, how you have continued to be a blessing to the ministry. I can't tell you that we'll talk about it more this month the number of places and situations we've been able to intervene and minister to because of your faithful stewardship. It's just, it's, it's, it's miraculous. Uh, uh, we just sent, um, uh, just sent the ninth District, uh, Bishop Seymour, just because we sent $1,000 every year, we sent $1,000 to economic development. Uh, uh, and we're able to do those things disaster over here, situation over here, situation over here. And guess what? It, it's real church. It's real church. It's real, real church. And then, and then watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I'm show you, can I show you a little secret? When you keep giving out, God says, oh, okay, that means I'll trust you with more. So then God will touch uh, Prince George's County elected officials and they'll, okay, well, we'll give you something to help get it out to the, yeah, you, you got it. Get it out to the people. And, and, and so what a blessing. It is in giving. It's a blessing in giving. It's a blessing in giving. It's a blessing in giving. I'm going to preach that till I die. There's a blessing in giving. You always ought to have more seed in the ground than you do in your hand. In your hand, you can only do so much with it. But once you sow it and put it in the ground, it always comes back multiplied. <laughs> it comes back multiplied. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give it to you? But somebody gave me a check uh, just the other week. Just, this is for you. I'm like, what? Surprise you. Just surprise you. And the first thing I'm looking for, now who can I give something to? Because <laughs> if he can get it through me, he can get it to me. Are you with me on that? Information on how you give is on the screen. And uh, you can give electronically through uh, GiveLify through our website, ubame.org. Uh, or you can give through the mail-in postage paid envelope. We try always to send those out to all of our givers as well as all of our members so you have them. And so many of us hold up our phone because we use the Realm app or GiveLify app for giving. And so, Father, we thank you for the blessings of grace and mercy. 
We pray that you would bless now the seed and the sower, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for your gifts. I believe now we go into this moment for the last 13 months. We have observed the empty hands of communion. Can you say amen, somebody? One of the bishops of the church, Bishop Clement W. Few, uh, wrote a wonderful article at the onset of this pandemic, um, and we chose the route of safety uh, for our congregation, and we celebrated with empty hands. Lord willing, uh, this is the last Sunday we will celebrate in the empty hands, and I'll give you instructions that are coming out uh, to you this week. Um, had a wonderful uh, meeting this week, a teleconference with the Director of Health for the AMB Church, Dr. Miriam Burnett, my friend and colleague, and you've seen her in many platforms around. And I just asked her, I said, okay, where are we now? Uh, as the church is talking about General Conference, and that's another issue with outside of our purview. But she said, where, I said, where are we now in this timeline? And she said, we reached uh, an acceptable timeline to be able to at least distribute safely elements. Hello, somebody. And, and other things. So Palm Sunday, we just gave it a little test run. That's all. We just said, hey, you want some palms? Come by and get it. About 100 of y'all came by. It was wonderful. And uh, we knew that these things are working, and they have to work in time with God's wisdom. Remember, we talked earlier, wisdom and faith. <clears throat> faith says uh, he, he will cover me with his wings, with his feathers. He will protect me. And uh, wisdom says I don't need to put myself in a way where he has to. I can just walk wisely. Amen. And so there's a balance of the two. Faith and science do work together. And so we'll do the empty hands this Sunday. And then uh, the first Sunday in June, Lord willing, we'll give you instructions on how you can come by and pick up a disposable communion. We'll give you enough for three or four Sundays. All right. And there are some theological issues as well that are running behind that. That's why you don't see it consistent in every house. So there are the there's theology and principles and praxis which we will have to address in the general conference in this type of thing. Um, but you'll be able to come by on the Saturday before the first Sunday uh, next month and get enough for three or four months. We will then, that will give us a preview of the possibility of outdoor worship. Uh, amen, amen. I'd rather be slow and safe than fast and foolish. Amen. Amen. So uh, we do this with you in mind, with you in mind. If I had my brothers, I thought everybody just come on in the parking lot or something. But we have to do it with you in mind to be wise in all that we do. Now, having said that, we still have a long way to go to encourage our brothers and sisters to get vaccinated. Uh, to get vaccinated, to get vaccinated, get it back. Every month I go to get your birthday money and anniversary money from the bank and the tellers know me. And so they, you know, once I get through with the transaction, I ask them and say, now have you gotten your shots yet? Said, Pastor, we're working on, I'm working on, I'm on the list. I said, okay, good, that's better. Because you do know eventually to work here. Uh-huh, yeah. So we want to encourage that and uh, we refer Several of you all, uh, of course, Reed Temple and some of our larger country facilities are using medical staffs to be able to do that. And so we want to encourage you to go get your shots wherever you live. Uh, we also are blessed to have a connection uh, with the new MedStar. It used to be Southern Maryland, but it's now MedStar. And, and it is coming up. Amen. We know what it was. It is coming up. And so uh, if you have need, many of our members, we've been able to send you there 
uh, so that you can get your vaccination. Either you live or work in Prince George's County. Either way, uh, you can be vaccinated. Amen. Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. at the, uh, uh, is it FedEx Field? No. Well, the county is doing that 500 vaccines tomorrow morning. Yeah, so if I look that up, let's make sure we get that. I think that might be in the announcements. But anyway, let me just focus on this. If for the last 13 months, we've been using empty hands. Here's what it says. It says very simply that what we believe about all of these elements and symbols, we believe it by faith. Watch this. Not by sight, not by touch not by taste we believe it by faith and, and, and so I share this for the last time as I think I will um, Mr. Few shared the story we shared it with the congregation of Christians who were imprisoned and when they wanted to celebrate the Lord's Supper they couldn't because their hands and feet were in shackles and they didn't have any elements to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so in the prison, the unsaved prisoners promised and said, we'll keep up noise to distract the guards while you all are doing your service, your worship time. And, and, and so however they were sharing it in prisons with hands in shackles and feet in shackles, when it came time to share bread, they just held out their hands to one another. Nothing in my hand. I, I don't have any bread, but I do have a faith. When it came time to drink, symbolizing his blood, they, they held out empty hands. It reminds us that no matter how many wafers we eat or cups of juice we drink, it is not the sacrament that saves. It is the place of the heart of the believer. That's why Paul said, if you drink it without the right spirit, you'll drink sickness and damnation to yourself. Because it's not about what's in your hand and what's going in your mouth. It's about what's already in your heart. And so whether I have it in my hand or not that, that doesn't make it a difference but i do have the faith that his body was broken so my body can be healed his blood was shed so that my sins could be forgiven and so the most important part of the communion service and i think maybe that's one of the things god you know not just us locally but churches everywhere that all of this is by by faith and if you see it touch it taste it you don't have to exercise faith uh, did you get that you know when 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 you you want to get to the sanctuary but can't now where's your faith it's not just the room where we meet and fellowship and all that's special don't get me wrong it's special, consecrated, sanctified. It's special. But the real church carries Jesus in their hearts wherever they are. And so here's the most important prayer that's prayed. It's the invitation. You that do truly, earnestly repent of your sins, you are in love and charity with your neighbor, and you intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking henceforth in his holy way. Draw near how? With faith. It say draw near in person. Draw near in faith. Tune in. Lean in with faith. And take this holy sacrament to your comfort, meekly kneeling and making your confession to Almighty God. Here is the prayer. And we Methodists pray. You know, we Methodists, we always got a method. So it's called the general confession. This prayer comes all the way across the bridge from Roman Catholicism into Protestant Reformation. It comes over from Martin Luther and Thomas Cranmer, who, who established the Anglican Church. This prayer has endured for over 500 years. It's just a prayer of confession. 
We're going to put it up on the screen, and we invite you to pray this prayer with us. Because if the heart's not right, it doesn't matter how much bread and juice you consume. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us of all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in the newness of life to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you stand justified in the presence of God. Let us receive now the benediction after which you, you be news and information will come your way. We bless God for you. Will the real church bow down, get dressed, and then stand out? in the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace both now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let the church say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. I love you. Hope to see you Wednesday. you in Bethel's next Facebook Top Fan of the Week, Sister Ann Bostic. Thank you for your engagement and sharing. I did it. Our vaccine recipient for this week is Sister Mickey Smith. Schedule your vaccine shot today. Protect yourself and others. Share your vaccine photos and send to communications at ubame.org. On Wednesday, May 5th at 7.15 p.m., UBTV Member Moments presents a sit-down with Lady Dietra and Pastor C. Don't miss this special conversation with our first family. Union Bethel is celebrating all of our mothers with a special Mother's Day gift. To receive your gift, a drive through pickup is scheduled for Saturday, May 8th from 9 a.m. to 11 at Brandywine. If not available to pick up, please contact the church office. After you have picked up your Mother's Day gift, take a minute to participate in Union Bethel's Moments with Mothers Zoom call on May 8th at 1 p.m. Look for the Zoom information from the communications emails. Join Union Bethel's Mother's Day worship service on Sunday, May 9th with our guest preacher, Rev. Dr. Jessica Kendall Ingram, Episcopal Supervisor of the 1st Episcopal District. Union Bethel's Men's Day celebration is Sunday, May 16th with Rev. Dr. William H. Curtis, Senior Pastor of Mount Arid Baptist Church from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as our guest preacher. Union Bethel Church Conference with Trustee Elections is scheduled for Sunday, May 16th, 12 p.m. Zoom information will be provided on RAM and communications emails. All leaders must complete the assessment before the conference. To continue watching Union Bethel on Roku, Fire TV, and now Apple TV, you must download the updated version of From the Pulpit app. Search for From the Pulpit TV Network app. For an easier access to the COVID-19 vaccination, Prince George's County is offering a pilot walk-up vaccination clinic at the Sports and Learning Complex on Monday, May 3rd, beginning at 9 a.m. for Prince Georgians only. 
This is a one day event, only 500 doses, first come, first served. The Department of Veterans Affairs have the COVID-19 vaccine available for all veterans, spouses, caregivers, and recipients of the Civil Health and Medical Program. To make an appointment, call the hotline number at 202-745-4342 or visit the website at www.va.gov forward slash COVID-19-vaccine. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual worship service. Join us throughout the week and next Sunday to hear God's spoken word. Have a safe and blessed week.